Today, we're going to talk about emptying ourselves. Everybody say, empty yourself. <laughs> that can have a lot of meanings, can't it? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but whenever I've heard that term, one of the things I always think is, what does that look like? What, what does it mean to empty yourself? Uh, so let's just read, and we'll, we'll read several portions of Scripture, and then we'll uh, chat a little bit. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Meanwhile, when the crowd gathered by the thousands so that they trampled on one another, he began to speak first to his disciples, beware the yeast of the Pharisees, that is their hypocrisy. Then Jesus begins to talk about something I think it's really good for us to live with an awareness of. Nothing's covered that will be uncovered, and nothing's secret that will not be known. Therefore, so, so that right there, nothing's covered up that will not be uncovered. Let me just mention, God does things in the light. When things are covered up, it's in the darkness. God does his things in the light. Very, very important. Um, and nothing, it, it, it's amazing to me, we've seen it with athletes, right? We've, we've, seen, we've seen prominent athletes, I did not dope or whatever it may be. And then it's like they come to find out, it's like, yeah, you did. Okay, I did. <laughs> It amazes me that people still today will do things thinking that it'll never be uncovered. But Jesus said, Nothing, nothing's covered up that'll not be uncovered. Nothing's secret that'll not become known. Therefore, what you've said in the dark will be heard in the light. <clears throat> All of those lunchtime conversations at the restaurant where you roasted your pastor... Nah, you wouldn't roast your pattern. You might roast the music. <laughs> or you might roast an usher or a children's bird, right? now. Whatever you've said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you've whispered behind closed doors will be claimed, proclaimed from the rooftop. So that rise, that portion, those three verses right there, sets a stage for something. That we may think... We've got it under wraps. We may think that, that maybe how we're living, what we're thinking, but whatever, uh, is under wraps. But, but Jesus is, is, in this portion of Scripture, is saying, listen, God knows it. So then that then calls us to do something about it. Let's read on and we'll get down and then we'll go over to the book of Psalms. I tell you, friends, don't fear those who kill the body and after that can do nothing more. But I'll warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. But even the hairs of your head, or lack thereof, are counted. Don't be afraid. You are more valuable than sparrows. So, so this is something that's important for just uh, us to just understand that even, even knowing that nothing is covered up that won't be uncovered, even knowing that what we've, what we've said in the dark will be made manifest in the light, how many of you know you're valuable? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're valuable. And you're loved by God. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. Whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. And whenever, sorry, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be. When they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers, the authorities, do not worry about how you are to defend yourselves or what you're to say. Why? Because we live in the light. Amen? We don't, we don't live in the darkness. We live in the light, right? We, we, we don't have to back away from anything. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. Now, go over to the book of Psalms, 139. Psalms have, has been the church's hymnal and prayer book since it was penned. This is a Psalm of David. Interesting psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. We're not going to read the whole thing. If we had time, we would, but we're not going to. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from a far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word's on my tongue, oh, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in 
behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's so high that I cannot attain it. So then where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. Any of you ever tried to run from God? Can I tell you a, a good mission story? This is a sweet mission story. In 19, uh, help me with dates, babe. 19, 1986, I was in the Philippines by myself. We were living in Nova Scotia. And uh, I was, I was sent over there by God. I know that sounds really super holy and whatever, but I really was. How I got there was a whole other story. But anyhow, I, um, I get on a bus. I get into Manila. I'm all by myself. Nobody's there to pick me up. And I am supposed to take a bus from the airport to um, Angeles City. I was supposed to meet. Owen and Ruth Baker, which our ministry supported them until uh, both of them passed away. And, uh, but I hadn't, I had never met Owen, but I had met Ruth and I lived in their house when I was in Oklahoma for uh, a year or so. And um, anyhow, so they had given me the address and here I am. I, I had a, I had a suitcase with me and I had a camera bag that had and I had a camera in there, and I had $1,200 cash in that camera bag. And uh, it was late at night. And I went to the wrong bus station. I was supposed to go to where the tourists, where the rich people were to go and get on one of their buses. But I didn't know, and I, I went to the local bus station where the bus seats 40, and you put, you know, 800 on it. And... Um, I don't speak the language. I'm the only white guy on the bus. And, um, you know, I get on the bus and I tell the, I tell the bus driver, Angela City, and I show him the address. On, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Angela. So every little bit, I, of course, I don't know where Angela City is. Every little bit, uh, you know, if he'd slow down and stop, I'd go over his Angela City. No, 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 stay. I'll tell you. So <clears throat> we do. And finally, we get to a place, and I'm like, wow, this doesn't look like a city to me. And um, <laughs> there was literally, it was, it was close to midnight, blackout, hotter than fire. There's a, there's a pole with a light bulb hanging off the deal. There's no city. I'm like, he goes, this is where you get off. I go, onto the city. Yeah, get off here. I'm like, Wow. Okay. So then comes driving up these uh, rickshaw, motorized rickshaws. Um, and um, little did I know that they were, they dropped me off there so that they could take me out to kill me and take everything I had. I found that out later. But anyhow, I'm, I'm like, so 86, I'm 26 years old. 84, right? 84. I was 24 years old. So I'm trying to be assertive. It's my, yeah, it's like, wow, okay. Well, you are not in Kansas anymore. And um, so I, I, I get in this rickshaw with this one guy. I, I just forced my way in and I said, take me to this address. And he wouldn't pay any attention to me, just ignoring me, ignoring me. And I patted him on the shoulder. I said, take me to this address. All of a sudden, so I can't see anything behind me. It's black outside. There's one light. There's insects everywhere. You can just imagine. Anyhow, a, a white guy with, with light blonde hair just leans into my deal and grabs me and says, you come with me. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Scared. It's like, what did I do wrong? The, the tenor of his voice was, he goes, I, he goes we, we get in his car and he goes, just who in the are you? And I said, well, my name's Lynn Shaw. <laughs> I'm from Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I said, you probably won't understand this, but I'm, I'm here to go to a leper colony to pray for a specific person. He goes, oh, brother. He goes, well, you're with me. 
where are you going? I gave him the address. He goes, okay, I don't know where they are, but I'll find them. He goes, you're with me. He goes, you know, um, they were just getting, he goes, I, I speak to Golog. He goes, they were just ready. They were, what they were talking about is they were talking about where they were going to bury your body. And he said, so you're with me. It's like, okay, cool. So we get into his house and he goes, I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. He was a white, uh, he was an Air Force guy st stationed at Angeles Air Force Base. And he was married to a Filipino lady. We get in their home and um, he tells his wife, he goes, this guy is some man of God coming here to pray for people. And he goes, I can't even get away from it from here. I said, what's your story? He said, I'm the son of an Assembly of God pastor. He said, I took this stint to run from God. He said, I've been here doing just fine until you showed up. <laughs> and I said, well, it sounds like our meeting was just destined by the Lord. He goes, I guess. I said, do you want to get right with God? He goes, I've gotten married. So I just looked at his wife. I said, honey, would you, would you like to give your heart to Jesus Christ? So I spent a little bit of time talking to them. It was a, it's one of the sweetest ministry things I've ever done in my life. We're, we're kneeling on their floor around a coffee table. And this dude was probably six foot two, all that. And his wife was probably four foot ten. <laughs> and we prayed around that table. She gave her heart to Jesus Christ, and he, he got back. So... Whenever I read this portion of scripture, I think of that story. Um, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're here. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're here. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, um, even there your hand shall lead me. Aren't you thankful that God does not give up? Amen? Amen. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness isn't dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. 12 simply says this, shall paraphrase, God trumps everything. Amen? I, I shared the story in first service. I only found out just a few years ago, less than five years ago, what rock, paper, and scissors really was. I would watch people do it, but I never understood the game. I had no clue. Finally, I got brave enough because it's like, okay, here I am in my late 50s. I'm asking somebody, what, how do you know who wins? <laughs> right? So, so these people, no, let's do it. These people would do it. And I'm like, peace. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what that is. And, you know, I'd watch him do it more. Oh, and he won. And, you know, I, and I played rock, paper, scissors a few times. And, and on, what I never told anybody, I had no clue why or how I lost or won. I had no clue until <laughs> somebody explained it to me. So God's the piece of paper when, is up, when you're up against a rock. rock. Rock covers. God's the scissors when you come up against a piece of paper. He wins. He trumps everything. That's so important. So important. Now, let's skip down 10 verses to go to verse 23. Because it's interesting. Psalmist is saying, search me, O God. Wait a minute. Verse 1 says, you have searched me. But now he's asking, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. He already said that. You've searched me and know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. Now he's given voice to it. This is the same idea as repenting correctly. You can't just live that life with the idea that, well, God knows my heart. I, you don't know how many times I've had and I'll, ha I'll have in the future this conversation. Well, you know, God, you know, God's in charge of everything. And if he's in charge of everything, then he has everything under control. So it really doesn't matter. It's all just predestined. You know, this whole thing is just kind of predestined. And so, you know, I just live. It's like, but, 
but aren't you involved? Well, you know, if, if God wanted it, I would, or blah, 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 blah. And it's like, guys, we got to give voice to some things. And that's is why emptying ourselves is important. It's, it's more than just, it's more than just saying, God, you know me. The psalmist said that. But then he's giving voice and saying, God, search me and know my heart. That's really, really important. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the everlasting. Paul said it to the Corinthians in chapter 15 a different way. He said it like this, come to a sober and a right mind. How many of you know it's important to see things clearly? As opposed to this idea that you have in your head, right? It's interesting. You, you find this happening sometimes when you go to a new country with a language that's not familiar to you and you learn a couple words, right? You, you, you learn, usually learn thank you. Um, maybe you'll learn something like good morning. Uh, you might learn a, a, a greeting or something like that. <clears throat> and if it's really hard... Um, because it's so foreign to your ear, you think you're pronouncing it correctly. Yeah. Right? Uh, we had a youth pastor years ago. His name was Leroy Tucker. He and I laugh about this story because it's so funny. He went with me to Bulgaria. And um, the word for uh, thank you in Bulgarian is blago. Blag is, refers to God a bit. Blago daria. So you got to put it together, you know, blagodaria. Now, I'm, I'm speaking it with an accent, I'm sure. Pastor Leroy could not say that word to save his life. Finally, he just said, I'm just going to say, blow it out your derriere. He goes, that's, that's, and that was his deal. He would, he would eat or something like that, and he'd just look at him with the sweetest look and go, blow it out your derriere. And, and, and it's like, Leroy. So we would go, we would work at night. It's like, you can't pronounce that like that. You, and he goes, I'm pronouncing it right. It's like, no, you're not. Oh, we just, we just laughed. Any of you have ever done anything athletically? Now your athletic prime days are over. Okay. <laughs> I was using Sutter, Leah's husband, as, a, as an example this morning. I can, I can, I'm 63, he's 20, 27. Oh, I can beat him in pickleball. Piece of cake. In fact, every game I play against him, I win, as long as I don't play. <laughs> right? And I have beaten him before, and, you know, there's whatever. My point is, Paul told the Corinthians, Get us, be of a sober and a right mind. In other words, stop lying to ourselves. Many times in life, we can lie to ourselves. And we think that maybe something that we're doing, we may rationalize it all, all, all sorts of ways to think that it's okay. When really and truly, guys, we need to give voice to it to the Lord and say, God, you search my heart. God, you tell me, you show me. When, when I was a, a young junior high and I was just starting to preach, I started preaching when I was 14. And so I, I had my, my strong concordance. How many of you remember what a strong concordance used to look like, right? You know, this big, you could kill three people on it if you hit them on the head real hard. I had my strong concordance and boy, I would study. And my brother and I lived in the same room and him being the big brother, you know, he, he was the one that turned the light out, right? And uh, so I couldn't have the light on past whenever brother said. And so I would, I would make a canopy in my bed over my head and I'd have a flashlight and I would, I would read so that he wouldn't throw a fit. And at the end of every one of those times, before I would shut the flashlight off, I would tell the Lord, God, just take a flashlight and shine it, shine it in the dark areas of my heart so that I can see what I need to do to worship you and to serve you and to, and to grow in this thing called the, my walk with you. So if I had to answer the question, then what does it mean to empty myself? Because we're also taught to embrace yourself, aren't we? In fact, we live in a culture that is 
all the arrows go to each of us, right? Life's about us. It's, it's, we, we want things to be easy. We want things to be pleasant. We want things to be palatable. We want things to be a certain way so that we can enjoy. We, we need to get ourselves happy. You know, self-help, self-happiness books are, are by far, I don't know, I've read a deal once. I think they're like seven to one of any other book that's written today is, is books about how you deserve this, you deserve that, whatever. So the thing of emptying yourselves, I think, is coming to an honest place before the Lord that we give voice and say, God, search my heart. God, reveal to me. Reveal to me things. And here's what's precious about the Lord. In knowing us, in knowing our good, bad, ugly, our warts, our, our to use the psalmist word, our evil, when, when God sees those things and knows those things, aren't you thankful that he still loves us? Aren't you thankful it's not crushing? In fact, I say that when we empty ourselves before the Lord, I'm not going to empty myself to somebody I don't know, but the closest relationship I have in life is my relationship with God. It's my most important. And I'm going to open up myself to, if I want to grow, and I'm just, you know, the Lenten season is a time frame that, that sets us up to where we can get reflective and we can, Psalms 139 is a perfect portion of scripture to pray. God, search me, know my heart, test me, know my thoughts, see if there's any wicked in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's precious about God. In showing, hearing, discovering those yucky things that all of us have called the flesh, aren't you thankful that God doesn't crush us? that he's there. He says, listen, okay, so that's what's there. Now let's walk out of this, right? Let's, let's get back into a healthy place. So next week, I can't believe we're already here. Can you believe it's this far into 2024? Uh, we're going to move to the cross and um, we're going to have a great Palm Sunday service. And then that week, Good Friday, don't forget Good Friday, we'll, we'll do a special service there. So turn to your neighbor and say, so empty yourself. Before the Lord, search me, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's bow our head and close our eyes this morning. If somebody's here by, or somebody may be watching by screen somewhere, I just want to encourage you to, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, uh, do so. Uh, come, come to the Lord and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. If, if you've strayed in your relationship with God, maybe you're one that's been on a wrong road. I want to encourage you. The road back to God is, 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 is simply the one that turns your face towards God and says, God, I want you. And then get on that road and get back in fellowship with the Lord. I'm going to ask for a show of hands here in a moment. And if uh, you want to respond, raise your hand. And I'm not, I just think there's a response there. Just as I think it's important to give voice to Jesus coming into heart, to give voice when we transgress, to give voice for the Lord to search us. I also think there's something to be said for us to acknowledge and say, I don't know the Lord and I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I think there's something to be said that I need to get back in fellowship with God. Then we're all going to stand and I'm going to lead us in a corporate prayer. We'll pray it together. So if you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, or you need to get back in fellowship with the Lord, would you just lift your hand anywhere across the sanctuary? I see that there, young man. Thank you. I see that over here, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? I see that there, young lady. Thank you, sweetheart. And back there. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Cool. Could we all stand up? If you're watching by screen, I encourage you to just pray with us while we're here this morning and God will meet you where you are. Let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, would you come into my heart and be the Lord of my life? I love you and I need you. God, help me to live the Christian life in such a way that I bring honor and glory to you. God, thank you for loving me, forgiving me, and accepting me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, praise the Lord.